Hey, everyone. Good morning. I'm Pastor Dennis, and it's good to see each and every one of you here. Welcome to those with us online this morning. We're in week number two of our current teaching series, Multiply. Today, we're looking at being a good steward of God's money and not a slave to it. And I pray today will be very helpful for each of us in a real, very practical world in which we live. So today, if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to the book of Wisdom, to the Old Testament book of Proverbs, where we'll use this as our base scripture today. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 5. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 5. Would you read that verse with me from the screen? Good planning and hard work lead to prosperity, but hasty shortcuts lead to poverty. One money myth that is held by many Jesus followers today is that financially, it'll all work out somehow. But the Bible teaches just the opposite, that it just won't all work out somehow financially, meaning you're not going to wake up one morning and say, golly gee, all my bills are paid. I'm giving generously to the work of God. I have a wonderful nest egg for retirement and I'm financially free. It just doesn't happen when we sit around and twiddle our thumbs and just have wishful thinking. We don't drift into that. Look again what it says in Proverbs. Good planning and hard work. It takes a plan. It takes a financial plan. It takes advanced decision-making. A plan is simply a tool that will help us in life to navigate through this world in which we live. A plan to work, a plan to save, a plan to invest, a plan to give. It's about making a decision that will affect our future and perhaps future generations. It's very interesting that many people don't have a plan when it comes to money management. In fact, ABC did a poll a while back and revealed a study that said that one out of four, 25% of Americans believe their best chance of wealth in retirement is through the lottery. And perhaps that's your retirement plan. You're just hoping, you're just praying, please God, that I'll hit the lottery. Others of you have a morbid financial plan. You're just waiting for someone else to die. I mean, you've done the math and the calculations, and this relative is older than you, and as long as they don't spend it in health care, that's your financial plan. My father has already told me several times, I'm spending your inheritance, Dennis. Don't count on it. And I said, way to go, Dad. <laughs> and certainly, the nursing facility is spending <laughs> it all for us all, Right? But what I want to do this morning is unfold a very simple plan, a financial plan of advanced decision-making that's worked in my own life. So this is more of a testimonial. It's deeply rooted in Holy Scripture, and it has been uh, endorsed and taught by many sound Christian counselors for 50 years plus. Now, today is a very interesting talk. Many of you hear me week after week. I've been journeying with you for a couple of years now. This talk is a little bit different because I'm sharing a little more of my story and testimony, and I'm sharing with you some pastoral, or for many of you younger, some fatherly advice. Many of my words today are not have to. They're simply get-tos. They're opportunities. Today, I want to share with you a plan that I've worked in my life for 33 years. That's a long time. That's longer than some of you were even born, right? Since I've been a pastor for 33 years, I did not grow up with any knowledge financially. But right when I started in the ministry, I had an older, wiser counselor, a financial advisor, who took me aside, and then others came into our lives as we were, Rachel and I were married. 
And they said, I want to encourage you and, and help you along the way. And so today, in some ways, if, if you like it to be, I want to be that older person for some of you, especially for the young people today. And so I'm not telling you today what to do or even this plan, period, in stop. You got it. But today I want to suggest to you to get on a plan. And I want to share you my testimony today as a pastor and friend that if you do it, it could change your life. It's called the 10-10-80 plan. Have you ever heard of that? Many financial counselors teach it. Uh, in fact, in our own Rooted Bible study this week, Pastor Fitz just so happened to share some of the teachings from that book, which endures the 10-10-80 plan. Here's how it works, if you're unfamiliar with it. You make an advanced decision before you pay your check to pay the most important people in your life first. 10-10-80. And so let's start with the first 10, the most important person. Number one, pay God, 10%. The first person in the 10, 10, 80 plan is to pay God. Here's why. God is the one who's given you life. God is the source of your existence. He's the source of your being. God is the one who gives you the ability to get out of bed, to to do the work. God is the one who opens up windows of opportunity and also closes doors. Without God, we would be nothing at all. And so we acknowledge this. This is called first fruits giving. Before we do anything else, we take a portion of our lives, the first portion, to acknowledge that God I am acknowledging that you are not over 10% of my life. You're over 100% of my life. And to acknowledge that, I'm recognizing you first. In the Old Testament, we see it many, many, many dozens of places where the people of God were called to, to give the first portion of their crops in the harvest over to God to acknowledge that God is the Lord, not over that portion, but of all. We see that in the way that we worship. On the first day of the week, Jesus rose. So Christians, traditionally over 2,000 years, gather in the morning on the first day of the week to acknowledge that God is not just the Lord of Sunday, but God is the Lord of every single day, all seven. But on the first day of the week, I'm going to acknowledge that before anything else, God is is my master. God is my Lord. This is called a tithe in the Bible. Taking the first 10%, it says, God, you are the owner. I am the manager for a period of time. You are the giver of life. And this whole concept of tithing is taught through all the old and also understood in the New Testament. Jesus would have understood it well. I believe Jesus tithed and the disciples as well. And he actually gave more, and the, the early church gave more than a tithe. The most classic passage, of course, is well known. It's often read that some of you grew up in church have read it. It's from the prophet Malachi, chapter 3, verses 8 through 10. Hear are these words. Should people cheat God? Yet you've cheated me. But you ask, what do you mean? When did we ever cheat you? You have cheated me in tithes and offerings due to me. You're under a curse, for the whole nation has been cheating me. Bring all the tithes, now listen to this, into the storehouse. Underline that, into the storehouse. I'm going to come back to it. So there may be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's army, I will open up windows of heaven for you, and I will pour out a blessing so great that you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. One of the only places in the scripture where God actually says, test me in this. Now, let me just pause right here and say for my wife and I, we've been married for over 30 years. We've always felt personally, and again, I'm sharing my testimony, that the temple, the storehouse, has been the local church that we've been a part of. Because that is the temple in which we've gathered to worship. It is the place of community that we have gained 
life, with relationships. It is where we're fed spiritually through other people as we've grown together. And so we've always felt personally that the storehouse, that there might be enough food in the house to do the ministry that we would be giving there. Now, I understand that some people take their giving and their tithe and they spread it all around other places, whatever God calls you to do. But for us, we've always viewed it as the local church. Now, beyond the tithes, our offerings are other places. And so as we have given our tithe, we've also continued and still do today, give other places and other ministries and parachurch ministries and even our Christmas CMO that we participate here. For us, it's over and above our tithe because our tithe is to have food in the house that all will be fed. And God says, if we obey the tithe, then he will pour out a blessing to us. I remember in a Bible study once I was in, a person wanted to argue the tithe and said, well, Tithing is an Old Testament principle, has nothing to do with salvation. We're saved by grace through faith. It is not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, Ephesians chapter 2 says. So he dismissed it on the basis of salvation. And I said to him, tithing has nothing to do with salvation. Salvation is a free gift given to us through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's not the purpose of tithing. What is the purpose of tithing? Moses said it in Deuteronomy chapter 14, 23. The purpose of tithing is to teach you to always put God first in your life. That I acknowledge that I'm not a slave to money, that money is not my God, and I acknowledge that, that God is the leader and he's controlled over all that I have. I want you to know, friends, this is not a message when I'm preaching on tithing to get more money to Gingsburg Church. Because the truth of the matter is that if we do not get the resources in the giving that we need, as a good leader, what we need to do, what I need to do is simply lower the budget. And we've had that in the past. We've had to cut staff. We've cut ministers. And that's what we'll do again as a response to whatever we receive. Ultimately, we're just stewards of God's resources. Why I'm preaching and teaching tithing here today in my own life is because this is about my response to God. This is about the God who made me, who loves me. This is about my response to a bloodstained cross, that there's no way that I can outgive that, but I want to acknowledge that my life is given to him fully, that God is my God. So let me share with you something that I'm not embarrassed to say. I used to be kind of embarrassed about these talks. I'm, I'm not anymore. I've been, I'm too old for that. <laughs> Some of you know my story. I've been here for a few years now. But I came from a lower class income family from Appalachian, Ohio. That's why I have a little twang to my voice. And even when I entered into ministry right after four years of college, I had student debt, which is somewhat normal today. But I had my little church and also enrolled in graduate school to take on more debt. I had one suit because this was a suit wearing church. You had, the preacher had to wear a suit back then. But I did have two ugly ties that I'd switch off. The women's group of this little church, Highland United Methodist Church near Hillsboro, got tired of me wearing that J.C. Penney suit that my mom bought me. And so she, they decided to put their money together and they went upscale. They, they went to Elder Bierman. That was upscale. They bought me a green suit. That's a suit I met Rachel in. <laughs> she remembers that suit. I'd put it on the day, but I'm too fat, so I've gained too much weight since then. My salary, everybody likes to talk about their first salary that's old, right? That's not relevant, but my salary was $8,900 a year. $171 per week. And so I took my little checkbook, this is before online giving, and every week, $18, $18, $18. But still today, after all these years, by the grace of God, every pay 
the first 10 and now more goes to the work of God in the local church. And the reason I share that is because if I lost my job tomorrow, and we have in our family lost jobs in the past, I would make lifestyle adjustments before I would stop that first fruits giving. I'd sell my house. I'd sell my motorcycle. Motorcycle would be after the house. (laughs) Before I would stop the tithe. Here's the reason. Because God's not on trial anymore in my life. I really believe this thing. If I was saying this today and that you would find out that I wasn't, that I'd be the biggest hypocrite in the world. But preachers got to believe what they say they believe. Amen? We really believe this thing. And I just want to say, as the children are amen and back there, I want to encourage you. The first 10 in a 10 10 80 plan, and this is not a have to, it's a get to. But in this plan would be to acknowledge God first in your life and your finances. Number two, the second person you're going to pay is yourself. You say, pay myself. Wait a minute, that's odd. My name's on the check. What do you mean pay yourself? Yeah, but when you start spending, does it all go to you? No, it goes to everybody else that you owe money to. The Bible says those who work hard deserve their pay. You worked hard. Why don't you pay yourself? Why don't you put 10% in this plan into a investment fund, like a mutual fund, that it will grow over time, that you won't touch it for a period of time, that you'll just let it grow and grow and grow. This is not a mad money fund. This is not a vacation fund. This is not even an emergency fund. This is a fund that you set aside maybe through a 401k or a 403b or maybe an IRA or especially maximizing a Roth IRA, and you'll just let it grow over time. Is this biblical? Absolutely. Read the parable of the talents in Matthew chapter 25 about the wise wise stewards, the power of investing and how one fully steward didn't invest. He just buried his treasure in the ground. There are millions of people who work for 20, 30, 40 years in America and they get to the end of their work life and they have nothing in retirement. Why? Because whatever they made, they just wastefully spend it. I want to encourage you, before you do anything else, to save. Here's the beauty of God's plan. You don't have to make a lot of money to accumulate a lot of money. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 11 says this, dishonest money dwindles away. But whoever gathers money little by little makes it grow. Underline that little phrase, little by little. A little money over a period of time. This is called compounding interest, of course. Will grow and grow. Now, let me give you an example of compounding interest. Say, for instance, you're 25 years old, young people, and you save just $5 a day. And you get with a wise money manager and you invest that in some mutual funds, and you leave it alone. And it grows at an interest rate, and we're just going to use a general interest rate of the last 50 years, the standard of the last 50 years. You can Google that, find out what it is. I know what it is, right? That's less than a large Starbucks, right? You go to Inglewood, you get a Starbucks right now, the pumpkin spice, the the largest one, $6.50, right? Let's say, for instance, you take $5 a day, and you let it sit for 40 years, $5 a day, $5 a day, $5 a day, because of the magic of compounding interest, that little coffee money would have grown into around a little less than a half million dollars. And that's just Java money, right? But many of you think my circumstances are are too, too bad, too tough to pay yourself. So you close your eyes thinking, well, it's just all going to work. I'm just going to run up this day. I'm just going to live day to day. Anyway, isn't Jesus coming back? I'll just wait for the rapture and escape all this mess that I've made in my life. No. The Bible says the foolish person just spends and spends. The wise person saves for the future. 
Would you re- read with me Proverbs chapter 21, 20? Read it together. The wise person saves for the future. The foolish person just spends whatever he or she gets. You heard your own voice say it. Are you a foolish person? Or are you a wise person? And so what you're going to do in a 10, 10, 80 plan is you're going to pay God to acknowledge that God is the source of all that you have. And you're also unleashing God's oversight and blessing into your life and finances. Number two, you're going to pay yourself in some sort of fun with good, solid, not risky, but good, solid uh, funds that will grow and grow and grow. And number three, pay others, 80%. With your final 80% of your income, what are you going to do with that? You're going to pay everybody else. You're going to pay your taxes. You're going to pay your mortgage. You're going to, especially at first, you're going to get out of consumer debt. You're going to join a group like Dave Ramsey or whatever it would take, and you're going to maximize, live poor for a while. Our first 10 10 years of marriage, Rachel and I decided we were going to be debt-free other than mortgage. We were going to get out of school debt. We were going to live poor. We were going to do whatever we had to do. We were not going to buy new cars. We were going to let the cars just run for 20 years. We were going to do that in order to get out of debt. You're going to buy clothes if you need them. You're going to pay for school things for your children. You're going to whatever it would be within that 80%. And if you have a little extra, you can go and feel good and splurge and go out to Dairy Queen on a Friday night and eat a blizzard. (laughs) But what you're going to do, you're going to be intentional about not being a slave. The Bible says that the 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 debtor is slave to the lender. Jesus came to set us all free. When we see these credit companies endorsing these big stadiums around the United States, friends, that just didn't come where they're able to spend these millions of dollars because they're just nice people with a lot of money. No, it's money that we have spent in our own debt, right? Now, some of you are saying, I wish I could live on 80%. You don't understand, Pastor. But I can't. And I want to say, I think most of us can. Most of us can. Here's two reasons why. Because there was a time for, for most of us, especially living here in the affluence of the upper Miami Valley, is that there was a time when 80% was 100% of our income. And somehow, you got by, somehow you had a roof over your head. You may have been eating ramen noodles every night, but you made it. And you can make it if you really try. But the second reason is because God promises you can. The real test of advanced decision making is that we really trust God's plan. He said he would take care of us. My God shall supply all your needs, not always our wants, our needs according to his riches and glory. Will you adopt a financial plan, whatever it would be, like the 10-10-80 plan, instead of just twiddling your thumbs and hoping that everything will work out and trust God for the results? Again, I'm not telling you, you have to do it. I'm just, as someone came alongside of me years ago and said, Dennis, you've not been taught this. You've been taught just pay the minimum you can on your credit card. But I'm saying work together on getting out of debt and start investing now at 25. I've been doing this for 33 years. And what happens is little by little, things will come together. Now, you're saying, well, if I did something like this, I'm a young person, what could be the results? What would be the payoff? (laughs) Well, again, if you've been around this church, you know that we don't give to get. This is not the prosperity gospel. But God does say he takes care of our needs. So let me give you an example of what could happen a fairly conservative example. I've already given you example about Starbucks money. But let's say, for instance, you're 30 to 50 years old 
you have a total household income of $70,000 gross. That's kind of middle class here in the Dayton area for two persons. You're a two-person family, two-person income. Seventy. I know some people make more than that. I know some people make less than that. But you're working hard. And for the next 20 years, you don't get any raises. You just keep on making $70,000, but you have a sound job, and that's what you make. By the end of 20 years, if you're following the 10-10-80 plan, you would have given a hundred and forty thousand dollars to the causes of Christ. Wouldn't that be great? I mean, that changes lives. And if you had put the next 10 into a mutual fund growing at the interest rate that has been standard the last 40 years, by the end of 20 years, you'd have somewhere around $530,000. That'd be exciting. Now, what if I stayed on that plan? What if I was 25, and then at 45, I went 20 more years until 65. And I'm, I'm pouring extra into my 401k or my 403 or whatever it might be. And I'm going to say that some of you have opportunities of matching funds from your employer, and you don't even max them. We have that here at church. We have employees here. We try to tell them it's up to you. But, and so I, if you're hearing this message, staff, I, I want to encourage you. I can't make you, but I encourage you. We're going to match the gift up to a certain percent if you do it. <laughs> what if you did that for 40 years? Then you would have around $4 million in this nest egg. Can you see the wisdom of Proverbs chapter 21, verse 5. Plan carefully and you'll have plenty. Now, I want to say, again, as a testimonial, this is not a have-to, but it's an encouragement to find a financial counselor. Someone pulled me aside years and years ago, and I want to be that cheerleader, that older counselor saying to you to find someone that you trust to work with you on a plan, to look at your budget. I've been preaching this for over 25 years. 33 as a pastor, preaching it for 25 years. That's my cue to say it's about time to wrap up. (laughs) And I always have people after messages like this come to me. Some say, I can't be done, pastor, can't be done. I say, well, do you have a financial plan? No, well, I will encourage you. I will encourage you to get with the financial counselor to work on debt. To begin to save, whatever, start now. Do nothing, get nothing. Do something, there'll be different results. But always after a talk like this, there are people who say, thank you, pastor, for believing God's word <laughs> enough about advanced decision making. I'm on a plane. I'm working on my life. Money doesn't master me anymore. Let me give you one story as we close because the stage is falling apart today. (laughs) This is a true story from the Gingsburg coffee shop. And actually, I just heard another person after first shared a similar story. I'm in the coffee shop. Now, you can't make this stuff up. About a year and a half ago. And I'm just greeting people before an event. Someone comes in that's not a member of this church, but it's an old friend of mine. For the event. And she said, Pastor Dennis, good to see you. We hadn't talked like 15 years. I was her pastor. Some of you know that 20 plus years ago, I was a pastor in Piqua when we built the new church out there by the high school, Grace Methodist, where the pond is on 25A. And it was a wonderful ministry out there. And she said, I remember a sermon that you preached 20 years ago. And I was just like shocked. I mean, I can't remember what I preached two weeks ago. And the people here don't remember what I preached last week. I preached on the importance of bringing children to Jesus, right? From Mark chapter 10, if you get that message. She said, yeah, you preached this sermon called the 10, 10, 80 plan. I said, wow, you remember that? Now, everybody else hearing this story right here is thinking, okay, Pastor Dennis is recycling sermons. She said, yeah, and we actually believed it. 
we started to apply it to our lives. We asked God to cover our lives with his blessing. We started a little savings account. I started maximizing more my 401 account. We started putting money aside. We made a decision very early. We were going to get out of debt. We were going to pay off our mortgage early. And we were going to live within our means. 20 years have passed. We are consumer debt free. She, she said, our house is paid off. Right here in the coffee shop. She's telling me this story. She said, we are financially free. Now, why do I tell that story? Because I've preached many bad sermons over the years, and maybe this is one for you. <laughs> it's not a boasting event. I'm telling you as a friend that story from the Ginsburg Coffee Shop, a real story. Because in 10 years, in 20 years, in 30 years, that can be your story. That can be your story. I'm 90 years old. I'm walking around with a little cane back there in the back. Someone else is the preacher. Noffy, he's the preacher by then. Fitz, Fitz's son, Marcy's son. I'm walking around as the old guy in the church, Pastor Dennis. We've applied 40 years have passed. Because whoever the sun sets free is free indeed. If you always do what you've always done financially, you always get what you've gotten. It takes a plan. It takes a financial plan. You can start one today. Holy Spirit, thank you that you care about every area of our lives. This whole issue is really not about money. It's about obedience. It's about trust. You said you'd supply all of our needs, not all of our wants, but all of our needs according to your riches and glory. You've shown that in my life time and time again. Help us to trust you more today, to lean on the everlasting arms to take your hand and walk through this life. This is scary. Some of us are full of fear right now, but I just pray that you'll give them a sense of peace. Bless our homes. I also pray, Lord, that you'll open up new doors of opportunity for work for people, for those who are struggling. I pray that where there seems to be no way financially, that somehow, Lord, and we even pray that you'll continue to use Gingsburg. As we say we love you, help us to do something about the poor among us. We do it together. And so lay that on our hearts, we pray. But we pray all this in trust in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have been blessed by this video, feel free to comment on what spoke to you. Hit the like button and share this with a friend who needs encouragement today. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel so you won't miss out on any of the latest videos. Thank you for watching and we'll see you soon.